Welcome, everyone. Today's event uh, features Karen DeWisha, and uh, she's going to present the ideas in her book, Putin's Kleptocracy, Who Owns Russia? And this book has got a lot of play recently, so I'm sure many of you have, have seen it uh, mentioned. It's been reviewed all over the place, and Applebaum recently had a, a long review of it in the New York Review of Books. And uh, so we're very happy to have uh, Karen with us today. Uh, she is currently the Walter Havigshurst Professor of Political Science in the Department of Political Science at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And she's also the director of the university's Havigshurst Center for Russian and Post-Soviet Studies. She earned her PhD from the London School of Economics and her BA in Politics and Russian with honors from the University of Lancaster, England. Prior to her academic career, she'd been at the State Department in policy planning and also at the Bureau of Politico-Military Affairs, also at the State Department. She's written five books, edited numerous volumes, authored many journal articles, and continues to do research and teaching in the areas of post-communist transitions and Russian politics. Please join me in welcoming Karen DeWisha. Thank you very much, Charles. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invitation. I, I'm not going to speak for very long today, but we all have, my plan is a lot of time to, t to have Q&A. So I'll just give you some a brief introduction to the book and a couple of ideas from the book, and then we can, I mean, talk about Putin's corruption for an hour. I mean, what could be more fun than that? Um, what's very interesting about um, politics toward Russia at the moment is that at, at the very time when I was struggling, really, to find a publisher uh, for this book. Uh, some of you may know the backstory that it, it had been submitted and accepted and then refused by Cambridge University Press. At the very time this happened, the U.S. government put sanctions <laughs> on fundamentally all the people who feature in the index of my book. <laughs> it was a validating moment for me, for sure. Um, and here we have a situation in which, just to look at some um, gross numbers, Transparency International uh, estimates that the annual cost of corruption in Russia is $300 billion. The capital flight from Russia is estimated by the Central Bank of Russia to be from 2005 until the beginning of this year, 335 billion. This is official numbers. This isn't money that's leaving the country via suitcases. This is official. And in October, the central bank, this October, the central bank's latest figures estimate that 30 billion left the country in October alone. Um, and by the way, <laughs> during Putin's own speech to the uh, joint houses of the Federation. During that hour, the automatic cells that were locked in by a number of people who were obviously were in that room also were exercised. So during the speech itself, the ruble slid. <laughs> so this, this speaks to a pretty fundamental lack of faith in the ability of the regime to maintain its uh, stability. Nevertheless, 110 billionaires are estimated by Credit Suisse to control 35% of the wealth of the country. A at the same time, UN estimates suggest that Russia now scores below Nigeria 
in its ability to control corruption. And I think we could also all agree that Nigeria is not exactly at the top of the league tables. So it's a, it's a very tragic situation because here is a country that scores very high in terms of human development index numbers. It's a country that has a highly educated and cultured population that is more than capable of building something substantial. And yet we have a system that has been created by a narrow group of people uh, to serve their own personal interests. And the Putin system, I write in the book, operates by nationalizing the risk and privatizing the reward. If you are part of the inner group, you will be rewarded by not being arrested. You will be rewarded by not having your funds taken. You might have to pay some of the, those riches to others in the group, but it is, a, it is a, a pattern, a tribute system that is quite significant. So uh, just a word about um, the story of the book. So I did not actually start out to write this book. I, did I didn't focus on Putin's corruption professionally, uh, but I focused more on elections, democratization, and so the I spent much of the 1990s talking about transitions, uh, wondering whether Russia would make it or not. And then I would say starting at around 2007-8, with the electoral cycle of that year, I began to just wonder, when did this fraud start? It was so obvious in 7-8, and I started working backward. My, the, quest, the kind of driving question for me was, when was the authoritarian moment in Russia? When did they decide to do what clearly they had done? And so I started to work back on 2004, totally fraudulent. And then I arrived at 2000, the Duma 99 election and presidential election. And I, I had to come to the conclusion based on, you know, just doing the work that the 2000 elec election was stolen. That Putin would not have won the presidential election in 2000. He won by 2,002 million votes in the first round. He would not have won in the first round. We don't know whether he would have won in the second. But he would not have won in 2000 without substantial fraud of many different types. But he only needed 2.2 million, and he got that a couple of times over. Which then raised the question, well, what is this system all about? What is really going on here? That you have a project to take over power by fraudulent means. And that's not to say that there weren't problems with the 96 election. I'm not making this case that Yeltsin was this one wonderful person and Putin is this one horrible person. There were problems in 96 too. But the 2000 election by somebody, uh, the, the victory of Putin in 2000 was a victory of someone who had a public opinion poll uh, name recognition of only 2% in August 1999. So what was the project? So I make the argument that Putin was um, part of a group that began to coalesce in the late Soviet period, approximately when they saw the uh, Polish and Hungarian elections taking place in 89, when the communists were completely wiped out. And they realized that, I'm, I'm using this term loosely, they realized that this idiot, Gorbachev, could do the same. He could actually institute a multi-party system, and we could lose our access 
to state funds. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union uh, occupied a monopolistic position, which means it had complete access to state funds. The, the state budget was their budget. So the do documents that I discuss in the, in, the, in the book show that beginning in 89, 90, they got permission, this is KGB senior people, working with a group of conservatives in the Communist Party, KGB senior people got permission from the Communist Party to start moving money out of the country into uh, what had been, what were, long-standing KGB bank accounts abroad. And they moved virtually all of the money. They completely uh, crippled the... Op uh, ability of Gorbachev to implement economic reforms and when Yeltsin came to power he found the same situation. The money was gone. He hired Kroll International to look for the money. It's a company that had looked for um, Kuwaiti money that Saddam Hussein had taken. He look, looked for Marcus's money from the Philippines. They looked for the money. They couldn't find it. The conclusion was it was buried so deep already in 1990 that the chances of ever recovering it were close to zero. And one of Putin's, um, one of Putin's PR people who was responsible for making Putin's image in 99 and 2000, Gleb Pavlovsky, Pavlovsky uh, who has split with the Kremlin, has stated that Putin was part of a very extensive but politically invisible layer of people who, after the end of the 1980s, were looking for a revanche in connection with the collapse of the Soviet Union. So they were looking for an ideological revanche, but they also were looking for the recreation of a system in which they had exclusive access to the country's riches. These people were, some of them were senior to Putin, and I go into that in great detail. Uh, some of them were junior and his, were his, you know, uh, generation. But all of them had an abiding uh, respect and uh, idolized Yuri Andropov. And there were quite a number of books that came out in the 2000 period in which Andropov uh, is lionized along with Putin. So you had um, the former head of uh, all the Russian illegals, Soviet illegals, who had been involved in the Rudolf Abel case, uh, writing a book on from Andropov to Putin, talking about the rebirth of Russia in 2000. I mean, this is, this is a country where this stuff doesn't happen by accident. Um, and so it was a signal that these very senior KGB people had their candidate, and that, that candidate was Vladimir Putin. The core of the book is really on the 1990s, and um, then I also talk about the contemporary period. But... I think it's important for me to underline that the, the research in the book, which is, um, you know, you might agree or disagree or have a different point to make, but the research in the book is very substantial. And it represents um, the most conservative analysis of what really this period was about. I did many, many interviews uh, both in this country and in Europe, of people who worked in the government, former ambassadors and so forth, also uh, Russians themselves. I didn't use the interviews. I mean, that they obviously directed me in interesting ways uh, and raised issues and made, you know, there were suggestions of what was really happening. It's an interesting set of notes. But... What I wanted to demonstrate to my colleagues in the academic world is that this was a story that was public. The, the, the book that I wrote is totally, anyone could replicate it. 
It's everything that I write there has multiple sources. So um, having said that, I, I'm saying it's a very conservative analysis. The book contains major sections on um, the establishment of bankruptcy, which was part of the um, US government uh, sanctions. On the food scandal, the food scandal, so bankruptcy was established in 1990, so it's something that goes way back to St. Petersburg. The food scandal was a scandal in 1991 uh, that Putin was absolutely at the center of, in which he signed contracts for his friends and acquaintances that allowed them to take raw materials out of the country at previously, uh, at previously domestic prices and sell them abroad for m world market prices. And the idea was that they would bring, in return, food back to St. Petersburg. Any of you who were in, s in Russia in that period know that that was a very tough winter. And there that was a winter when people used the word hunger. And in St. Petersburg, they know what this word means. So there was a lot of fear in St. Petersburg. Uh, I, that, that scandal led to um, Putin being uh, named as some someone who acted criminally. And the legislature of St. Petersburg, by name, demanded of the mayor that he be fired in 1991. So there's a lot on that. I have all the documents on that. Uh, Putin's supervision of the gambling industry, a portfolio that he didn't have to have, but he sought and was very involved in. Putin's involvement in a company called SPAG, which is a, a, a German registered company that listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange in which he was a member of the advisory board. A SPAG came to the attention of Western security services and police organizations when they were looking for Cali cartel money. And that trail led them to SPAG because SPAG, which had um, Russian mafia on its board and Putin on its advisory committee was laundering money from the Cali cartel back into Russia for investment. Um, a, uh, there's a section on the Petersburg Fuel Company, which uh, was a company headed by the head of Russian mafia in St. Petersburg, Tambov gang. Uh, and Putin gave them a monopolistic and exclusive contract. The establishment of a trust uh, called the 20th Trust, which build, built um, hotels and apartments in the south of Spain using the mayor's contingency fund money that led to a criminal case, number 144128. You can go into the Russian... Russian website, yandex.ru, and just type in that number, you get a lot of interesting stuff. And in general, the uh, unauthorized use of mayor's money, which led to a much larger case, a federal case, in the late 90s, as Putin was trying to make his way up in Moscow. The last big attempt to stop it uh, led to three federal agencies joining forces to bring a case against Peter's Petersburg-based uh, politicians who are now coming into Moscow. And that was a case 18-238-278-95. So I'm not going to go into any of these cases, but I'm going to give you a background on two people who were involved and who remained involved in um, Russian politics. And you'll see Putin's hand, uh, the extent to which he was involved. And the first case is the case of a man called Vladimir Smirnov. Smirnov was involved in the food scandal. 
he got contract number one from Putin, actually th the actual number one, and he was able to sell abroad uh, 100,000 barrels of oil at world market prices. When the uh, St. Petersburg legislature called on Putin to be fired and his deputy, of course, needless to say, the deputy was fired, he wasn't, um, one would have thought that Putin would have gone to Smirnov and s told him, look, this isn't working. We didn't get away with this. But instead, in 1996, when the Ozero Cooperative was established, a gated community of people who were f businessmen together and live next to each other in the lake northeast of St. Petersburg, Smirnov was listed on the documents which are reproduced in the book as the leader of the Ozero Cooperative. And in 1996, there were laws on private property which would have allowed all of them to live happily next door to each other as private citizens with private property. Instead, they chose to establish Ozero as a cooperative under the Gorbachev era laws. And that, to me, was very interesting because they all hated Gorbachev. So what was this all about? And the conclusion I come to I is that it had nothing to do with the property. It had all to do with the bank account. Because under, uh, under the Gorbachev era laws, you can establish a joint bank account and everyone who's listed in the cooperative can share. So people can put money into that bank account and people can take money out of the bank account if they are listed. And Putin and Smirnov and some of the other people who are now on the sanctions list were both listed as um, members of the cooperative and the bank account number is 18046-1008. So this is all written down in the, you know, in the documents. So Putin then goes to Moscow. The Ozero Cooperative is in St. Petersburg. One would have imagined that, well, they already have their cooperative, so why didn't any of them just retire? Smirnov, by the way, is trained as a nuclear physicist, so he has no energy background for <laughs> exporting 100,000 <laughs> barrels of oil. Um, but here we have Smirnov turning up again on the board of SPAG with um, the head of the Tambov Mafia, Kumarin, and Putin on the uh, advisory committee. So in 1999, the BND raided, the German, German intelligence, raided and arrested those people who were caught uh, in laundering money on a, on a very massive scale, by the way. Gerhard Schroeder came in as chancellor and this investigation of Putin ceased. In 2001, the, um, the non-Russians were, who were involved did, were put on trial and some of them did serve time. But the US government, not very happy about BND's failure, the German government's failure, um, leaked some of these, some, some of the information about this case saying that um, there was a sheaf of intelligence reports linking Putin to SPAG, including that he signed St. Petersburg city funds over to the company's benefit. So this is a, you know, an early and continuing pattern. So Smirnov was caught and involved in SPAG. So here's Putin, he's about to become president. He becomes president, is inaugurated in May what happened to Smirnov? Did he retire somewhere? No, he became the head of Tenex. Tenex is responsible for 50% of the world's trade in nuclear materials. 
This is a very serious situation. We gave Tenex $3.5 billion in um, aid for implementing the megaton to megawatt program. And Tenex provides nuclear material to the Bushehr nuclear reactor in Iran. So here you have someone who is directly connected to Putin, who could, if he received the right uh, order from Putin, stop supplying these materials. But he didn't. Second person is Viktor Zolotov. Putin is a deputy mayor, we're going back to the early 90s, and he obviously needs and deserves, in the situation of the early 90s, protection. So there are perfectly fine police forces and security forces in St. Petersburg who could have pr provided protection, but instead he chose to hire a private security firm to protect him. And this firm, called Baltic Escort, was headed by Viktor Zolotov and Roman Sepov, who is an um, important person in his own right, but I'm not going to talk about him today. He, he died of poisoning in Russia in 2004. Anyway, so Zolotov, uh, Zepov is who we're going to deal with because he's still on, on the scene. Uh, Russian journalists who followed organized crime in the 1990s, some of whom had intelligence background, said that Zolotov was responsible for carrying the Chorny Nal, the black cash that Putin extracted from gambling from the casinos all over St. Petersburg. And he became Putin's um, personal bodyguard uh, in charge of all of this. As one of the journalists I quote say, that Zolotov worked with the mayor's office to fulfill orders that could not be put in the hands of official law enforcement agencies. Zolotov then uh, becomes Putin's personal bodyguard as president. He followed him to Moscow and followed him right up to the very top. So in 2000, he became Putin's personal bodyguard. And in 2000, summer, he came to New York City to set up Putin's, the security for Putin's UN address, which would be his first address as president. What he didn't know was that Mikhail Trepashkin, who was the resident in New York, was already turned and would in December defect to the United States and write a very interesting book called Comrade J. Or be in, he would be involved in the writing of a very interesting book by Pete Early. And in that conversation, Trepashkin relates that amongst friends, which of course uh, he thought, Zolotov thought he was, that Zolotov was involved in uh, a plan to kill Kremlin Chief of Staff Voloshin to smooth Putin's path to power. This isn't a very crazy statement because in 1998 and 1999, um, many people who were in the way were suddenly no longer available for running. And that the plan was to, of course, blame it on the Chechens, but that the plan had to be abandoned because they realized, it, this is a quote from the book, <laughs> that it would involve not only killing Voloshin but others as well, and as he told Trepashkin, there are too many to kill, even for us. Zolotov became the head of the Presidential Protection Service in 2000 and was, from 2000 to 2014, responsible for the security of the black box. This is very serious stuff. So in 2014, he ceased being the, the presidential bodyguard and became the 
Deputy Minister of Interior, in charge of all internal ministry, uh, internal forces of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. So all the Oman troops, a anyone who is involved in putting down domestic trouble, now they are all answer to Zolotov. And one assumes, from just looking at the media coverage of this, that um, this move is a reflection of Putin's increasing nervousness about the stability of the internal social situation. I'm only, I'm only going to make one more point and then open the floor. And that's uh, a, the point that I want to make is why do I think that this wasn't just a haphazard series of events? Why do I think, why did I come to the conclusion that, th that this was a project? And a project developed in the mid to late 90s amongst a group and, and a project that may have had slightly, you know, one doesn't want to say that everything is determined in advance. Things certainly did change over time. And those senior KGB officials who failed in 1991 with the coup, maybe they wouldn't have succeeded with Putin. We don't, I mean, we can't say that this was, they were going to succeed for sure from the very beginning. But I came across a document which is dealt with in great detail in the book, and um, which, by the way, if you can go just to the second slide, there are two, two slides, now we're gonna go to the second one. Can you hit on the, on the uh, link? And go, go up, yeah. So, as, as a compliment to the book, and you can go, go down a little bit. Yeah, down a little bit. Down, down, down. Yeah, that's enough. So as a compliment to the book, I put all the documents I used for this book up on a website. So I think it's really important to, for everyone to understand what kind of argument I'm making. So there are live links for the entire bibliography, which is over 100 pages. And then there are documents from just below that, the food crisis, Stasi documents, there's a timeline. Uh, if you go up again, yeah, that's it. Then on the far right, you'll see Andrei Zikov's testimony. Zikov is, is um, the, a former uh, chief investigator for especially port important cases of the Ministry of Internal Affairs based in St. Petersburg, but he's a federal official and was involved in these investigations. So he disappeared for a while after the Bolotnaya protest, he came out and said, I'm going to give this testimony. So on that site, there are nine there's a nine-part testimony in Russian of what he says about Putin and Putin's activities. And the, uh, the, the testimony is transcribed into Russian, so you don't have to listen to it. You can just read it as well, but it's in Russian. Um, I just discovered last week that Zikov's testimony has now been taken off of Runet and YouTube, and YouTube but it is still on this site. Um, and the the final thing I'm going to talk about today is this document, the reform of the presidential administration. So the week before Putin was um, inaugurated, the newspaper Commerçant ran three days of articles about a leaked document that had been prepared in 1999 called the reform of the presidential administration. In this document, which runs about 40 pages and which is translated into English, actually, on the site. It's the one thing that I, I, I'm gifting. <laughs> um, it, it, gives, it gives a breakdown of the organization of the presidential administration. And on every department, in every uh, sub subsection, every department, it gives their 
open and public tasks, and their secret and actual tasks. The, pub <laughs> the presidential administration was, uh, the objective of this document was so that the presidential administration could tangibly and concretely influence all political processes that are occurring in society. If President Putin, quote, really wants to ensure social order and stability in the country during his rule, then the self-governing political system, which you and I would call democracy, is not needed. Instead, we will need a political authority that will create the necessary political situations in Russia and the near abroad. About opposition, it says that all the special and secret activities to counteract the opposition will be entirely in the hands of the special forces. Opposition media outlets will be driven to financial crisis. While the open function of the PA in relations with the opposition is to lock in constitutional norms and join forces in the fight against extremism, the closed function, in other words, the actual function, states it is necessary always to ruin coordinated plans of all opposition in general and each oppositionist personally. So this document was written before he even became president. I, I, I got this document and it, I spent, I would say, two to three months just trying to figure out whether it's true who would confirm it, what it means, because I wasn't really going in that direction of thinking that this all had a single conclusion. But I was really faced at the end of the day with saying, you know, what does this really mean? It has to mean that this was a plan from the very beginning. I think it's, to me, it's just the only conclusion. And once I made that conclusion, then many other things fell into place. So I'll stop there. I was planning to talk about Spain, but I won't. Um, I will say that I hope that the actual trials of Russian mafia um, that are planned to restart in December will do so, and I hope we all watch that trial very closely. Um, but just to conclude, everything that, the, the, the basic structure of this book suggests that this project was known by 2000, that it was well structured, that it involves not just happenstance. There were no accidental autocrats, which is a, an, a term, an article uh, many of us in the field know about. Putin didn't stumble into this. He was part of it. He, he was not always the senior member. He was not the only member. He is very beholden to people. Many of them are still in power today. Um, but from that point of view, I would say that the, one of the biggest conclusions that I m drew from doing all the um, interviews that I did was that this failure to confront who Putin is and who, what his regime is, is a political failure in the United States. It's not an intelligence failure. It's not an intelligence failure. And the sanctions, the way that they were introduced, and the, their scope suggest that people in the government know, knew very well uh, from a very early stage what they were dealing with, but were not listened to. Thank you very much. Right. Well, thank thank you very much, uh, Karen. Do, is the sound okay? Uh, I should mention I'm uh, Charles Davidson, and um, I publish the American Interest magazine. Um, but I also direct the Financial Corruption and Autocracy Initiative here at the Hudson Institute. So uh, we're very happy to have um, hosted uh, uh, Karen. And these these are um, uh, these are very stark conclusions that she's come to about Russia. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering whether she'd be willing to speculate a little bit on uh, where she thinks U.S. policy uh, has failed, has, has not been strong enough, I suppose she's suggesting, and also to talk a little bit about where she thinks Russia might be heading, what the future may have in store. And after that, um, we'll <coughs> move to questions from the audience. I think it's an absolute bipartisan failure. Uh, George Bush looked into Putin's eyes and soul, saw his soul, and I, saw, I interviewed many people in the government who said that after that, it was over. This kind of view of Putin was not something they could push into the, the system. And of course, the, the reset was based on, on the same idea that there are topics that we have abiding mutual interests, and we should deal with those and forget about the topics that we can't agree on. I will say that in two, 2006, I think, it may have been 2007, uh, Bush went to St. Petersburg to the uh, economic forum, and he did say in that forum that we need to cooperate to do something about kleptocracies. But he didn't name anybody, and of course, nothing happened. So uh, th there, there, were there were political operatives on the Republican side and on the Democratic side, right up to the very top, who were involved. And of course, one, you know, it's equal opportunity blaming. So uh, the Europeans were in no mood. <laughs> Their banks were absolutely flush with Russian money. Uh, they were investing big time in, in Russia. This was before Siemens had been uh, subjected to the largest fine in history by the US and for corrupt activities in five countries, one of which was Russia, to someone, Shamalov, who is at the very heart of the Russian regime. So there's plenty of blame to go around, but I think that's, that's, that's a situation that's not going to be able to be continued so easily. And where do, you, where do, you, uh, where do we go from here? Where, how do you see uh, uh, Putinism developing? If we let the mind wander a little bit, how do you imagine things I going forward? I think that the, the system is scared. The inner group is scared. I think the move of Zolotov to the Ministry of Internal Affairs is very important. It, it took place um, shortly before uh, a Ministry of Internal Affairs um, deputy director of the anti-corruption unit launched uh, an investigation of corruption in the FSB, and for his pains, he was, my favorite word, defenestrated, uh, th thrown out of a window. There's a lot of indication that the top elite are worried. They are not bringing their children back, they're not bringing their wives back, and they certainly aren't bringing their money back. Um, and. There's been approval of the creation of militias. Uh, this is, I mean, we have Halliburton or Blackwater in this country. Maybe we are, you know, in favor of that or not fa in favor of that, but it's something typical. The, the, the move to allow this in Russia and the move to set up militias attached to Gazprom, Rosneft, and the railways. Those are three big players who may be quite worried about whether they can trust uh, the very top. OK, let's go to uh, questions from the audience. Do we have the mics ready? Um, yes. Um, Nancy Lubin and Karen, it is so great to see you. Glad to see you. <laughs> it's been a, number, a lot of years. As somebody who's worked, you know, for the last four decades or so on similar issues in Central Asia and corruption and how it works and whatever, 
First, I love your comments. I'm looking forward to reading the book. And aside from, from the failure you see, bipartisan failure you see on the political side, you, you also mentioned in, in passing our aid to this megaton to megawatts program where we, we knew we were giving it to Smirnoff and we knew who he was, these several million dollars. And that seems as if it was replicated many times over in nuclear and other programs as well. So I'm just wondering if you can talk about the aid and assistance, whether through Department of Energy or aid or anywhere else, and to what extent were we in this country and also in Europe feeding the system um, through direct payments and direct support of some of these things and rather uh, aside from just looking in their eyes and ignoring it? Well, talk to people in uh, government, including somebody who's now a very senior person in charge of uh, nuclear issues in state. I'm not sure that we knew who Smirnoff was. I mean, you know, we I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know the answer to the question. I think these are very, very busy people. Uh, regi you know, regimes change in the, in the U.S. every four years. Administrations change. And people come in and they're given a one-page bio of who's in charge of this agency. I'm not sure anybody has the time. So, and are we really saying that every every meeting uh, between an American official and a Russian should be preceded by a 30 or 40 page biography in depth. I mean, I'm not challenging the idea, but I just think that the reality is there during, during the Bush administration with war on terror, during the uh, reset with other, other initiatives, there just were priorities. And if the Russians could deliver. I mean, you know, if if we could get from them um, targeting data in Afghanistan, it's great. I don't think many quest other questions were asked. By the way, same thing is happening with ISIS now. So, but leaving that aside. <laughs> um, and also, could you please state your name and uh, identify your affiliation? Hi, my name is Steve. I work and study uh, here in the city. Um, thank you very much, sir, for the forum, and thank you also, ma'am, sort of like um, reports of CIA misdeeds, uh, contemporary Russian politics is the gift that keeps on giving. So could you indulge us in just a few topics um, going over over the past couple of months rereading Godfather of the Kremlin and uh, the whole survey of Boris Berezovsky's turn in Russia and the hierarchy. Could you look at uh, uh, the great... Um, Chechen war uh, and its role in sort of chicanery, financial chicanery in, in Russia, uh, the influence maybe also of uh, Beshlan and uh, Shamil Basayev, and mm. um, I guess a really big question, sort of the elephant in the room, what is Mr. Putin's net worth and, uh, hmm. or the estimates of it? Um, and I guess the bonus question is, what is uh, Dr. Merkel's influence on him? Thank you. Zero. That's the third question. Second question, 40 billion. First question's more difficult. Uh, okay, so you could make the, ar this, is, this, is, this is how the Second Chechen War, I believe, happened. It was a, a little convenient war paid for by Boris Berezovsky, uh, planned, <coughs> in a house owned by uh, an infamous Saudi arms dealer in the south of France, in which uh, the head of the Kremlin administration appeared along with Basayev. So the war was completely made to order. Raids occurred into Dagestan. Responses were made. This is in the summer of 1999, and Putin was put in charge of dealing with a renewed Chechen threat. And as part of that threat, 
uh, bombs started to go off in Moscow and in other cities, including one that was found and diffused in Ryazan, south of Moscow. And that um, attempted bombing, in the previous bombs had led to thousands of people, totally innocent civilians, being uh, injured, 300 were killed when their apartment buildings collapsed while they slept. It is a historic false flag operation. I mean, it is much bigger than the Gulf of Tonkin. And it was done in the capital of their own country, to their own people, to their own innocent people. The Ryazan case is important because three FSB uh, operatives were actually arrested for this in Ryazan by local police who were exercising due diligence given the state of panic in the country. They were, their call to FSB headquarters was monitored by a telephone operator. Never <coughs> underestimate the power of middle-aged women to listen to conversations. <laughs> and they used their FSB IDs to get out of detention. And they were never charged. And the citizens of Ryazan were so outraged that in the period just before the inauguration of Putin, there was a television program in which they refused to back down on what had happened. So this is a public document that is very available. Um, and there was FSB culpability in this. Direct. They claimed that there was a civic exercise. This was to test people's readiness. But you don't test people's readiness for a bomb by planting a bomb in, in, in an apartment building where, where there's no alarm that went off. It was timed. There was a timer. It was <coughs> supposed to go off uh, in the, you know, around dawn at some time, 5, 5 a.m., 6 a.m. The bomb disposal team never backed off their story. I mean, there is a wealth of information on Ryazan. So in my opinion, it was, it was part of the plan to put Putin in power. In the middle there. Yep. <coughs> um, Michael Yehuda. Hi, Mike. You go back a long time. Yeah, we do. Um, I'm currently at George Washington. University. Um, given the nature of, of the regime that you have described, uh, would you like to comment on how that factors in to relations with China? Yeah, are we seeing really the emergence of a kind of what used to be called an unholy alliance? Uh, I, one of the um, uh, conventional wisdoms that one hears around Washington is that Sino. Um, Russian relations are bound to break up. Uh, given what, what you have said, given the, the nature of the regime in China too, it, it would seem as if they are, <coughs> in a way, natural allies. Yeah, I mean, it's a great, great question. Um, my own take on that is that China needs its economic relations with the West more than it needs a strategic relation with Russia. I don't, I think that there are a lot of question marks over even the validity and likely implementation of the contracts that have been signed between Russia and China. There are many people in Russia who believe that these <laughs> contracts will never be implemented and that they have no legal force, that they were political acts that were given to the Russians when Putin, on the last day that Putin was, was in China. I mean, I'm not in a position to say that's true or isn't true, but I think it is an, uh, an interesting possibility. The, the, um, what the Russians are using China for primarily is money. So money is leaving Europe, um, and I, I know from somebody who is tracking this, 
that on the night that the European sanctions were implemented, money left Switzerland, but it didn't go back to Russia. It went to Singapore and Hong Kong. So they need Hong Kong to hold stable in financial terms. Not sure that they're so much interested in, in, in the kleptocracy in, in Beijing. And I will say just one final thing. I mean, it's obviously a long subject. The problem for Russia of signing these contracts, dodgy contracts, with China is that China is not going to be taking these contracts and the complaints to any European or London court. This will be dealt with in their way. So, I mean, it will be very interesting to see whether the points of unity that they have between them will be further strained by Russia's woeful inability to implement contracts. The gentleman just, just behind the one who just asked the question. Thank you, sir. Um, Ma'am, I'm John Gizzi, Chief Political Correspondent for Newsmax. Congressman Robert Pittenger, the Chairman of the House uh, Task Force on Terrorism, has come out publicly and said the U.S. should do all it can to overthrow Vladimir Putin. Uh, and he has suggested expanding the Magnitsky sanctions that target individuals in Russia, such as many of those you mentioned, uh, to a degree where the inner circle in the Kremlin would depose the president from office. One, is that feasible? And two, do you see the European Union, for example, adopting Magnitsky-style sanctions to add more power to the ones that this country uh, adopted, passed by a Republican Congress and signed by President Obama? Well. The EU has passed supportive legislation three times, but all EU legislation has to be then passed again at the national level. This is not going to happen. So forget this. Uh, I mean, there would need to be, I mean, I think that the, what Putin has done in Ukraine already rises to a serious enough level for the Europeans to do something more, but they're not. And so one should focus on what, can, what we can really achieve. Um, I, I'm, it's funny, I, of course, I've come over to be slightly a Magnitsky convert. I think what Browder has done is very remarkable uh, politically to, to get that level of support and organization. His tenacity is truly to be applauded also, a, I'm, I'm rather in favor of stealth instruments. I, I you know, I, I like the idea that a Russian oligarch wouldn't know in advance, because there's a list, that something bad may happen to his money, or that he may not be able to exercise his right to travel, or that the U.S. is going to take measures A, B, and C. I, I, I think that compared with what we can do publicly, what we can threaten to do privately is probably more interesting. And I do think that they're very worried about it. So I, I, and, I, and I also do think that the Europeans would be infinitely more reliable in that regard, doing things, I mean, especially let's say the British and the French would be, in, and the Germans, would be infinitely more reliable if they could have a quiet word and simply move against certain people than get involved in this, uh, you know, what, what after the beginning of the year will be even more uh, congressional noise on this subject. Center there. Sorry. Don't worry. We have considerable amount of time, so we should get to most of you. But the gentleman, yeah. Thank you, John Constata, Redzima Photo. Thank you very much for your work that you're doing. Um, three questions. One: Have you 
found more acceptance in American academe for the kind of work you're doing? Two, do you find that your work is, do you find a response within the US government to your work? And three, would you be able or willing to comment on the extent of Russian corruption of American uh, media, academe, and uh, the political world here? Thank you. Um, I'm probably not the best person to talk to about the direction of political science as a discipline. Uh, but I do think that there are many studies now that are coming out of comparative authoritarian regimes. I mean, I think we finally can put to bed the idea that democratization is the be all and end all of every developmental strategy. That's over, completely over. Uh, yes, the, the, the book has had great, great resonance in the policy world. And, um, you know, I've given quite a number of talks uh, on it in the policy world. On, um, on the, the third, restate the third point. Well, that's a very interesting question. So um, I went uh, to, va I, there's a, there's a, um, a Kremlin organ sponsored Ketchum funded, uh, no, Kremlin funded Ketchum organized <laughs> annual meeting uh, in, called Valdai. And I used to go to those meetings. I, you know, look, we go, we go back, people have been in the field to the Cold War when there was Dartmouth uh, meetings between the United States and the Soviet Union. I believe in dialogue. I believe in dialogue. But where I really stopped, I, I broke faith with whole, the whole Valdai thing, is that it's not about dialogue at all. It's about getting a message from the Kremlin and, you know, having the access to Putin for four or five hours, and, and very interesting discussions with you know, other people in the top administration is something you can't get just by asking for a visa. So people who are seriously interested in studying Russian politics would, I think, always be interested in that, in that interaction. This is not to, to um, criticize them for wanting that interaction, and this is academics, uh, former policy makers, retired policy makers, and journalists from the US and from many other countries, including many from Europe. And, but I think that we have reached a point now where, you know, if President Obama is not going to sit down with Putin, why is anybody else doing it? I mean, everything that we know about the way that regime works is you go in, you listen to a, now, this wasn't always the case, but you listen to him speak for four or five hours. Everything that he says is on uh, channel one. And then there are cameras that provide cutouts of academics, journalists, former prime ministers, or whatever, sagely nodding in agreement. So that's that, that use of Western public opinion by the Putin regime, I think, has led, beginning last year or the year before, to more and more reputable people refusing to go. But as I say, I am in favor of dialogue. So if there were a serious uh, roundtable that were established for continuing contacts, I would be so, totally in favor of it. You asked a specific question about corruption. Accepting trips is corruption under, let's say, US laws if you are a congressman. And so I, I suppose one could say that accepting a trip to Valdai is an example of that. 
But there's a lot more that's going on in terms of Kremlin funding of uh, um, there's a there's a con an annual conference that takes place in Rhodes, for example, operated by Yakunin, who's the head of the railways, on you know the third civilization. Moscow is the third civilization, not called that, but that's what it is. It's what it comes down to every year, um, and everybody has paid the way paid their way for that. So there there are more examples of what I would say activity that would not pass muster in U.S. under U.S. laws. Uh, just back there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Laure Mendeville. I'm the chief correspondent for a French daily newspaper here, and I spent before 20 years covering Russia. Um, I, found, I found your conclusions extremely interesting, and I was myself in actually in Ryazan during a do, doing some investigation of all the And I quote some of your articles ago. in the book. <laughs> okay. Um, I, uh, I'm very interested by the major idea of your book, which is there was a plan. Actually, it's, it's, a, it's a question that all the people who've been dealing with Russia have been bumping into. Uh, s there was a plan. You, you, you're talking a, of, a, of a group of people who actually designed some kind of revanche and some kind of, 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 of project to come back to power. I mean, th these are very murky years. I haven't read your book, so I don't know how, y how you are explaining all that in the book, but um, c can you t talk more about these people? Because you, you say Putin was probably a junior member of, of that circle. So who, who according to you, ha have you identified specific people around older people who participated? W were you able to talk to some of them? And how, how that you answer more? is no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, it was organized at the very top of the KGB. Kuchkov, who organized the 91 coup, the failed coup, served some time in prison uh, a couple of years, but came out and was certainly made, he made himself available to Putin, and they had meetings, which Putin admits to, when Putin became head of the FSB. He was there in 2000 at the inauguration. I think another person who was uh, very important to Putin uh, was a guy called Drozdorf. Drozdorf was an illegal in Germany. Um, at the time that Rudolf Abel was traded back he was traded to the Germans. He went across the bridge in Berlin because he was thought to be German. Of course, we know he was a Brit who was actually Soviet. But he, he, was, he was infiltrated into the US through the German displaced persons camp. So when he was traded back to uh, the Germans, the East Germans, he was traded to his cousin. His cousin was Drozdov. His Drozdov was an illegal, and he was playing the role of the cousin. So from the very beginning, you have somebody who was um, a, a real hero. It was a major intelligence coup, because of course he turned up immediately in Moscow, uh, Abel. And Drozdov is still alive and is a, a, a very active author and became, was in charge of, of training first all illegals in Germany, and then he was in charge of the illegal section. And then he was also in charge of the operation that killed Hafizullah Amin in Afghanistan. So he wasn't just infiltrating illegals as a function. He was also put in charge of special forces unit that killed the sitting president of Afghanistan. Um, you know, and I you know, recommend Roderick Bra Braithwaite's book, Afghansi, on that. Um, so when uh, Putin came to power, here you have Drozdov, who had then been put in charge of Spetsnaz. And the trans 
transferal of uh, obliga not obligation, but Spetsnaz became a force for domestic operations. So you mentioned Beslan, Nordost, who was in charge of those, Spetsnaz, who was in charge of reorienting Spetsnaz, Drasdorf, Drasdorf. And in Dresden, I have a picture of this, it's not in the book, in Dresden, there is a plaque to Rudolf Abel. And uh, that whole episode, which is one of the most important episodes in KGB history, for KGB legend, let's say, the most important episode is the Gulag, but for the ex uh, external affairs, Rudolf Abel was very important. And so Putin's absolute, uh, in the, the way in which he was so enamored with Germany, the way he was so enamored with um, s sp foreign operations. We know Drozdov went to Dresden. I know that. Drozdov turned up in Dresden after the collapse of the wall. And, and I know this from a, a published source by the head of the Dresden office. He wrote his memoirs, and he was so proud that Drozdov came and helped get all of the machine, all of the crypt cryptographic machinery out of the Dresden office after the wall fell, after November 9th, 89. So Drozdov comes. So there were many opportunities for Putin to be recruited and to be involved um, in this plan, in my opinion. Back near the column. <clears throat> Michael Mobbs, Department of Homeland Security. Two questions. Uh, what was your greatest difficulty that you encountered in doing your research for this book? And second, but only if you choose to answer, uh, have you had any concerns about your personal safety because of this work? Um, well, it's both very interesting questions, of course. <laughs> um, the greatest difficulty, I would say, honestly, just sorting through the vast amount of information that there is once you start investigating this seriously. That's why I, I decided to, to only rely on published resources and to publish the live links, 100 pages of live links. That's just the stuff I used. I mean, there's so much more. I mean, if you wanted to investigate any one of the people close to him, you could, you could go down that rabbit hole and probably never come out. There's so much stuff. that, And, and this is why I dedicated the book to free Russian journalism. This book you couldn't write about now. You couldn't, you couldn't write a story about Putin moving forward, depending on free Russian journalism. You'd have to use other methods. Maybe you would even need to have be in the US government. I really don't know. But once the October of this year bill went through, saying that any um, media outlet with 20% or more foreign funding has to be closed down, we're going to lose some amazing sources. So you know anything that can be done to support free Russian media um, is, is very important. And I would say, because I've been talking about this you know, with Charles and others, anything that can be done to establish a kind of Hoover institution for the documents that those journalists have is extremely important. Because, look, we know how the regime works. When they pass a law like this, they will go in with Oman before anything is done, and they will arrest the computers. Because, you know, the, the journalists aren't really a big problem for them. You know, they can, bad things can happen to them. But those documents, if they, you know, if there are more of those documents like the one I got, and you know there have to be, then it, once they get into others' hands, then, then 
important things can be done with them. So that that's um, the most difficult thing. On personal security, you know, uh, no, I have I haven't felt it. I've been, you know, my Facebook page has been filled with, you know, accusations that I support gay marriage. By the way, I do. Uh, <laughs> but they didn't have to be so graphic about it. Um, and, you know, accusations of, you know, Jewish Masonic conspiracies and all that sort of stuff. Well, I mean, everybody in the West is getting, who writes anything is getting attacked in this way. Like, total badge of honor. So I, I don't think that's a problem. I would say that, uh, you know, even in the worst days of Stalin, uh, Westerners with no direct tie to the Soviet Union were not touched. There was a lot of very negative reporting on what was going on in the Soviet Union all through the worst days of Stalin. Now, if you were Trotsky, that's a problem. And if you are Litvinenko, that's a problem. But that's, you know, inside stuff. And the, the idea is that they would certainly regard themselves as having the right to get you, whether you live in uh, Miami, where Trepashkin died of a heart attack, or anywhere else. But that's, you know, that's all within the family. Hopefully. Uh, Abe Shulsky, I'm a senior fellow here at Hudson. Uh, thank you very much. This was fascinating. I wonder if you could spe speculate a little bit about Putin himself, what his motives are. You, you mentioned you thought his net worth was 40 billion, and in a way that's a little hard to even understand what that means. I mean, as long as he's president of Russia, in a sense, he owns it all. And if he were overthrown, I, I don't imagine he could keep much of his money, even if it's in the West. But is, is, is this whole effort that you mentioned, a kind of KGB effort to keep their own cast in you know power and 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 wealth or does it have does the revanche part have a sort of nationalist side to it as well i mean do you think he he is really looking to some kind of uh, restoration of russian glory as he sees it on a sort of nationalist basis as opposed to the sort of kgb uh basis yeah i mean that's a that's a, a great question you know um Pavlovsky, the PR guy, uh, has said that when he came into, into the Kremlin to work on the 1999-2000 um, election, that his task, and this is a quote, was to reawake in the Russian people the habit of adoration. And all of this stuff about you know Putin in all the states of unrest, to undress, <laughs> with all the animals, all of that is designed, and and he's talked about it very openly, to avoid what happened to Brezhnev. Brezhnev always had the same suit on. People got very, they they identified it, this, the whole situation as, um, as a story, as a, um, stagnating, stagnating, just because he didn't change clothes. That was their view. So they are giving the population this kind of daily uh, food of whatever Putin is dressing, whatever Putin is doing, you know, a very, you know, the action figure. And they're attaching to his body. I mean, we're talking literally about the embodiment of power. <laughs> they're attaching to the bo his body whatever they need. So in the first term, it was relations with the West. It's fine if you expand NATO. Well, we're not in that anymore. But I, I, I think that for, I do think that there are people who are close to Putin and people on the right, nationalists, who've become closer to Putin, like Rogozin, for example, maybe not close to Putin, but higher up in the, in, with authority, who, who are genuine believers. There's no doubt about that. Um, because he kept them at an arm's distance in the early period. But now, you know, all of those ultra-right or 
Russia's unique civilization kind of people, the Eurasianists, they're all there. They're all on television 24-7. So they, I think that there is a, a belief on their part that they, they are fulfilling a mission for Russia. But at the same time, they are not bringing their money back. So at the end of the day, this, is, this to me is the sort of bottom line of what you said the first, the first part. The bottom line is that he has to remain president because if he steps down, he will be subjected to criminal investigation. He knows it. He's on record as saying that in Russia, we solve everything by putting the leader against the wall. He, this is the way he, he feels. And so he's not going to step down. J.R. McBrien, sanctions consultant. I have two hopefully unrelated questions. One, in your book and in your remarks, you referred to early on an overall plan and planning. How does the involvement now that we have in Ukraine relate back to the plan? Is that part of it, or is it part of the plan gone awry? And then the second question is, do you have another list to add to the Treasury sanctions list? Oh, that's fun. Yeah, I think Gazprom and Miller. I mean, why not? This is so much fun. Why not have more fun? Double the, double the pleasure, double, <laughs> double the fun. I mean, that would be, um, of course, we're being held by, back by Europe on that. But in terms of deserving, uh, and I go into Gazprom in great detail in the book. I mean, there is a reason why Gazprom is trading at one third the valuation of Exxon, because they are stealing three times more. It's it's a it's a criminal enterprise that's being operated in Gazprom, and it's that is completely at the behest of Putin. This is really his private pot, Gazprom. Nobody touches it. So I would, I would say um, Gazprom would be number one. On, on the first question, is, is Eastern Ukraine a mistake? Well, the fact that uh, Putin hasn't gone forward with orders that he could easily give to take Mariupol, which is the small city, smallish city, uh, between in, in the very, on the coast, on the way to Crimea, suggests that uh, they are pausing. And because Mariupol was at one point the next target, and it was completely empty. The, the local population all left. So there wouldn't have been great casualties, at least initially. So if, to the extent that some were pushing for a land bridge to Crimea, I think that Putin has, has stopped that. But you know, he's now unleashed something that he, he can't really stop in eastern Ukraine. There are people there who are real believers in, in this. And of course, they are allied with criminal elements big time. And these Titushki and so forth who are being, you know, hired. I mean, there was a there is a very good article in today's Wall Street Journal about heavy industry in eastern Ukraine. And they, they talk about one particular case. You know, that, that company, which heavy industry built furrow, burrowing equipment for mines, had 800 employees. Now they're down to 200, which he pays the manager, the owner, out of his personal funds, workers are getting $6.50 a day. Now, the other 600 are available for, of course, for making money by other means. This is just the reality. And the $6.50 is also not so much. So there is a huge potential for uh, militia activity and in, in, in league with uh, criminal activity. I don't think that all of that is in Putin's hands. The other side. 
three rows down on the uh, near the wall. Thank you, Steve Landy, Manchester Trade. Um, <laughs> one serious question and then one quick light question. Um, serious question. You seem to say that because Bush maybe knew more, didn't know more, but it didn't seem to affect his public posture towards Putin and so on, same thing. I spent a lot of time working with developing countries, and the U.S. drives me crazy with the sanction policy, where we'll sanction a country because of the corruption of its leaders, even though the major course of the sanction will fall on the poor guy who loses his job or whatever else happens. But what, what do you want us to do? They are there. They are powerful. China is corrupt in many ways. Russia is corrupt in many ways. You got the question, the drift, and so on. I mean, my view is if they do give us the information on ISIL, if they are working with us, I can't, I can't do that anymore. And then my short question is, what when they accuse you of being a messianic Jew? What's a messianic Jew? I just don't know, but I believe in messianic. I guess I don't know. Masonic. Masonic, yeah. oh, Masonic. The Jewish Masonic conspiracy oh, is alive and well. Masons, yeah. Tell me what and somehow to promoting gay sex. <laughs> All right. We're, we're going to go to the, the but, first but, row for the last question. But I, let me answer your, your, your less interesting question. Um, <laughs> well, let's just take a, the UK as an example. What could the UK do? I mean, uh, I've been to Russia more times then I, I could count, but I have decided that the health and well-being of the Russian people is not my, pri my primary concern. And if they are going to rob from their own people, then I myself can't sanction a situation where we say that's okay because uh, London lawyers made 160 million pounds in fees last year through adjudicating uh, one oligarch fighting another oligarch in, in London courts. So, you know, there are a lot of people who are making money and a lot of people in the West. I mean, I'm sure you're very well aware of the paparazzi who took a picture of uh, a document as it entered number 10, uh, in which the num they were having a meeting of the cabinet on what to do about the U.S. sanctions and whether or not to support them. And the number one thing on that photographed document was do nothing that will hurt the city. So, you know, I'm all in favor of the strength of the British economy, but I, I, I suspect that there's some activity in Britain that wouldn't uh, pass the corruption smell test. And not, not only in Britain, by the way. Uh, Jack Blum, and I'm with the Financial Transparency Coalition. Uh, I want to follow up a bit in your last answer. There seem to be an awful lot of people who are getting rich as a result of this Russian corruption. Mm -hmm. There are Swiss bankers. I was in the West End of London a couple of weeks back, and Russia was very much in evidence. Uh, in fact, you can see the Russian money in Miami and parts of the U.S., in, in uh, purchasing of apartments and uh, buying of residents in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that that is a very uh, damaging problem when it comes to actually dealing with Russia. And it seems to me that the enablers and the people who are making money as a result of it are inhibiting our ability to deal with the Russian problem. So that, that's one issue I'd like you to focus on a little more. But then a, a second question really is, you're re focused on Putin, but this stuff had been going on well before Putin. So uh, there's the business of Mark Rich uh, selling Russian oil, profits dropped in Switzerland. Uh, people who long before Putin emerged on the scene as the key player were busily looting the country, moving the money out, and obviously part of this KGB cabal. And I would note that most of the countries that were part of the former Soviet Union are headed now by former KGB people who are following precisely the same patterns. And I wonder if you'd comment on that. 
Well, I spent three three weeks in Miami last January, which was rough. But what I really was focusing on, uh, where, where are the Russians? What are they doing? How are they structuring their lifestyles there? And there's, I encourage you all to visit this. There's, there's three, uh, I mean, they're everywhere, but as an example of what you're talking about, there are three uh, apartment blocks, very ultra-luxury apartment blocks that dead end at the sea in Hillendale, Hillendale Avenue. I'm sure some of you know this rough. And they aren't even on the west side of the avenue. They're actually on the beach, leaving aside who should be buying hurricane, non-hurricane-proof apartments on the beach in Miami. Um, so my husband and I went, and that's a good, good way to stop. Uh, my husband and I went in to present ourselves as, you know, honest Midwest academics who are thinking of retiring and very interested in Hillendale, <laughs> close to close to the Starbucks where there's only Russian spoken and stuff like that. Um, and so the uh, uh, Hispanic uh, realtor said, "Okay, yeah, well, let's. I'll show you some some apartments." And of course. You know, I'm a chatty person. He's a chatty person, too, it turns out. And he was telling me these astonishing stories about how wonderful this building is. So um, for example, there was a, an apartment that he showed us, because it happened to be free, that was owned by a Russian. And the Russian had called him up that week and said, you know, I don't remember his first name, the realtor. I need to get rid of the apartment. You need to sell it by the end of the week, or I'm going to go somewhere else. And he said, luckily, we have some excellent clients in Latin America. <laughs> and so they were able to sell this. Now, this is a very common feature of what's happening. And um, in my opinion, it is only increasing because the Russians don't want to use banks, because they know that we are, we are listening in on SWIFT they know that we are tra tracking their transactions. So they are trading in apartments. They're paying debts in apartments. They're paying debts in art. They are moving uh, um, gold. They're, they're moving out of currency because they know to us, or they, they believe, they believe that the jig is up in terms of moving money. So this is a, a very, very serious problem, and it's not just a problem of Russians. Well, I'm afraid we've run over already, so we're going to have to stop there. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you. Thank you.